life is a seed. You can easily be the change that we need. Keep your mind alert and your heart with peace. Be the change that we want to see. Yeah, go and share your gift, yeah, your gift is a seed. You can easily be the change that we need. Keep your mind alert and feel your heart with peace. Be the change that we want to see. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mentality Unchained. Uh, today, we got a special guest. Uh, this is my mayor of the city of Rockford, Illinois. Uh, I want you guys to please give him a round of applause because he didn't have to be here. And it was hard getting him because he's so busy. So, But I want to thank him for coming in. So without further ado, uh, Mayor Thomas McElmare. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, more than having me, thanks for the work that you're doing in the city. Thank you, thank you. See, so uh, mayor gave me a shout out, guys. So, no. <laughs> so you're le- you're <laughs> legit, legit now. or not I'm legit? Le- depending yeah, on I'm how. legit now. So no, serious. <laughs> on a serious note, um, the mayor's been doing a lot of great work in the city of Rockford. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things is you know the people of the community. There's always a gap like we can't communicate with the mayor. We can't touch the mayor. We can't see the mayor But you're not that guy. You're you're like I'm accessible touch me do all these things, right? And I appreciate that about you because you helped me coming in you was like, okay Let's hook up with this person this person so you're not bashful when it comes to helping people of the community No, for sure And I think uh, one of the most important jobs uh, that I have and maybe it's not job Maybe it's more of a responsibility is you know, I'm only in the office for so long, right? And it's a big responsibility, uh, and it's a big honor to be in it. And uh, my opinion is I'm only here for so long, so be as accessible as possible. And people may not like the answers I give them, but I feel like I should be there. uh, And I think where I go is important, and what I talk about should be important. That's great. uh, Usually I don't have notes at all. I usually just talk. And we used to get usually just get into it, but I want to really have. I have questions specifically to the mayor, uh, because I know and people. As mayor, I'll decide which ones I want to answer specifically. <laughs> see, 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 he already starting already. So no, because the people really need to like hear transparency. They need to yeah. hear their mayor speak in terms of you know being personable and understanding the dynamic the dynamics of Rockford. Um, so, but just just to get started, tell a little tell the people a little bit about yourself, Mayor. Yeah. So, most uh, well, a little bit about me. Born and raised in Rockford on the west side of Rockford. Uh, near Ridge and John Street, mm-hmm. if people are familiar with Rockford. Um, youngest of six kids, uh, was really, really fortunate. I have uh, two amazing parents. One recently passed, uh, mm-hmm. now just about two, almost three years ago in September, uh, being my dad who passed. Mm-hmm. Uh, youngest of six, uh, I have about 16 nieces and nephews. Wow. Uh, I moved back to, I went to John Carroll, got my undergraduate degree mm-hmm. in sociology, criminology. Okay. Then ran, uh, worked in a community-based correctional facility, then worked for Senator Dick Durbin, then moved back to Cleveland, Ohio, got my master's degree in nonprofit administration, graduated on a Thursday, skipped the ceremony, moved back to Rockford, wanted to be closer to my uh family members especially my nieces and nephews because at that point i really didn't know them i yeah. saw them saw them on yeah. holidays and stuff right. i was in college and right. working so i didn't see them um moved back uh within about two weeks my sister was like you got to meet this girl you got to meet this girl and i said well anyone my wife or my sister wants me to meet uh hell no um <laughs> and then i ended up running into this girl uh-huh. at uh, helping my mom uh, set up for an art fair ran into her uh she was really cute, and uh, she. I that was a Saturday morning, around 9 a.m. Called her Sunday, went out to dinner Monday, and that was it. And wow. today I have two beautiful kids, uh, Malachi John, who just turned six, okay, uh, going into first grade at Rockford Public Schools, and yeah. Olympia Rose, who just turned seven, wow, going into second grade at okay. Rockford Public Schools, and uh, I'm married way up. 
So yeah. I'm, I'm doing all right. <laughs> That's great. I know you and I, we, we joke off air a lot about kids, and I always tell you my kids are so much older. And you're like, I'm just getting started, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just jealous. Yeah, right, right. So, Mayor, I, a lot of people don't know that your father was actually mayor, mm -hmm. too. So was that the inspiration behind you running for mayor, or did you not want to because of dad? What was the deal with that, man? So, no, it wasn't. I mean, I would say uh, yes and no. I mean, there was never, ever talk in my family that someone needs to run for elected office. Okay. Ever. The only thing my parents absolutely did say is no matter what you do, you can't go to work and come home. You can't go to school and come home. You can't go to work and school mm -hmm. and come home. Mm -hmm. You have to do something to get back to the community that wow. you live in. Wow. And so every one of my brothers and sisters, and all in different ways and mm -hmm. some in more impactful ways than being mayor, mm -hmm. are engaged in their neighborhood and their community that they live in uh, in really meaningful ways. And so I loved politics, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to ever be the elected official. So I loved working on campaigns and letting someone else get elected and <laughs> yeah. you deal with the Absolutely, headaches. Right? Um, I'll just help you get there. Right. And then um, I, I just kind of was asked to run for an office, ended up doing it, and it just kept moving on from there. So you never had any inspiration to do it. You just it just fell into it. Uh, I had inspiration to be involved in politics, either okay. being on the policy side or government affairs, but not mm -hmm. uh, not being the person who's elected. Gotcha, gotcha. I get it. So my first question for you, Mayor, is you pretty much answer, you know, uh, why you ran for the position. But, you know, what are some of the key goals that you ran on? Yeah, and I'll take a step back and say why. Okay. Um, because I, I was an alderman first, mm -hmm. and so I was alderman of the third ward of Rockford. Right. Um, which is unique. It covers east and west side of the river, mm -hmm. has some of uh, the wealthiest residents in Rockford, has right. the most uh, affordable housing units in Rockford, has all the arts and culture and the downtown. So it is really the melting pot of Rockford. Yeah. Loved the job. I mean, it was policy driven. It was dealing with constituent issues, big and small, but you really felt like you were helping people. So once I decided to run, I did fall in love with gotcha. it. I loved it. Gotcha. Um, and then... Honestly, I, we just had a baby and I was thinking about having that second one and me and my wife, I, she would tell you I'm a professional complainer. Um, she may use other words, uh, but I just felt like Rockford where we were was mm -hmm. not what I wanted to raise my kids in. Okay. And I am someone who's deeply in love with Rockford, but mm -hmm. I'm not deeply in love with Rockford today. I'm it, deeply in love with what Rockford can be and should be. Right, right. Um, and at the time, and I'm not knocking anyone, um, but there's difficult relationships. Uh, the mayor and the chairman at mm -hmm. the time weren't mm -hmm. speaking. The mm -hmm. police chief and the sheriff weren't speaking. Yeah. And I just felt like personalities were getting in the way of our progress. And I wanted to, I could do a couple of things. I could do what a lot of people do and sit home uh, at their mom's computer and complain. Mm -hmm. uh, I could um, move mm -hmm. or I could get more engaged. And me and my wife decided to get more engaged. Wow. So uh, from that point to now, what has changed in the city of Rockford, you think? <laughs> Everything. Right. Um, some by work we've done and some by life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, whenever you go through uh, once in a lifetime pandemic, yeah. uh, civil unrest, um, uh, we've had a lot thrown at us mm -hmm. in the six years mm -hmm. I've been mayor. Um, a lot has changed and some things have stayed the same. I would say um, one thing that stayed the same that I don't think enough Rockfordians appreciate is we have so, so many amazing quiet heroes yeah that do so much work not for any notoriety right right don't get any notoriety absolutely they're just running programs volunteering mm -hmm. at different mm -hmm. things holding meetings right really pushing our community in a better direction but they're they always go under the radar so that to me has stayed the same i will say one thing that has changed a little bit with that aspect is i think covid coupled with the civil unrest mm -hmm. has allowed some of those voices to raise up to another notch, another okay. level, okay. which I think is really beneficial for our community. Yeah. Um, but a lot has changed. I mean, some things that I am very proud of and excited for is uh, we now have, when I became mayor, um, domestic violence was the number one violent crime. We weren't even tracking it. Yeah, We didn't have any data on it. Right. 
And if you were a survivor and you were placed in the population center of the city, you would need to go to 15 to 20 locations to get services. Right. We created the state of Illinois' first and only family peace center that a survivor and their children can walk through the doors, be believed, be loved, and get all the services they need right. by now more than 30 partner organizations by taking one common intake wow. that's trauma-informed. Yeah, yeah. And obviously with mental health, you think about mm-hmm. – um, you going to each one of those organizations pre the Family Peace Center. Right. I mean, you're in distress, you've been traumatized, and now you're going to get help. And at each one of those organizations, by no fault of theirs, they have to have you fill out an intake. Yeah. And so you're re- – why are you here? What took yeah. place? You're reliving the worst days of your life. You're, we're re-traumatizing yeah. and re-victimizing the victims. Uh, so I, I'm very proud of what we've done there. I would say another thing I'm very proud of – is we uh, approved the Rockford Promise NIU partnership. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, you know, this is an equity issue. Uh, This is something that benefits everyone in our community, but the number one thing that holds young people back from moving on to that next level of education into college is the cost. Yeah, Uh, I mean, we just saw what the Supreme Court did with uh, the Biden's proposal. the cost is real. I mean, me and my wife uh, went on. And I got a master's. She got her bachelor's. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were paying at one point more for our, our mortgage, our taxes, and our insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were paying more than that for our student loans. Yeah. It's, every month. I know about student loans. It's so wicked. It's, it's, it's expensive. It's wicked. So the Rockford Promise now says every single child who lives in Rockford, mm-hmm. who goes to Rockford Public Schools, mm-hmm. works really hard and earns a 3.0, is mm-hmm. guaranteed is oh. promised a four-year degree at Northern Illinois University. So now I'm going to push back a little bit, sure. Mayor, because what do we do about those that make below a 3.0? I mean, what do, what kind of opportunities do we have for them? Yeah, so a couple of things. One, uh, we what we needed to approve was something, A, that could get passed, mm-hmm. and B, that we could afford. Okay. The worst thing that we could have done, in my opinion, was create a Rockford maybe. Okay. Um, and it, what we needed to approve was what we could afford. Right. And so I would say what we're doing right now is how do we expand that? Gosh, uh, right. You know, we're today on Rock Valley College's uh, campus. Mm-hmm. They're an incredible partner to our community Absolutely. and a great resource for our citizens. And they do amazing work do. Uh, with education and vocational. Uh, and so what we need to do is expand the number of institutions that mm-hmm. are fully uh, funded as a promise partner. Okay. And we need to broaden the scope of the children that we can serve. Uh, and that can be from maybe you bring that GPA down to 2.75 or right, 2.5, right, right. whatever that may be. Right. Uh, that also means let's include some vocational certifications maybe mm-hmm. here at Rock Valley mm-hmm. College. Yeah. So maybe you don't want to go get a four-year degree, but you want to get an aviation maintenance degree right. and go to work out at the fastest-growing cargo airport that's in yeah, Rockford. That's great, um, those are things that we are actively working on right now to find out who can, who, and how can we partner, mm-hmm. how can we fund it. Speaking of partnership and even with the, the aspect of mental health, how do you – what says what what's so important or what comes across your desk and you say look at it and you say okay i need to get behind this what is that one thing i don't want to say one thing but what are several things that causes you to get behind a, a piece of legislation or any type of programming or anything that like that so probably multiple things uh, drive me to support or advocate against, right? Um, because sometimes defense is just as important right. as the offense right. on certain legislation. So uh, one, I think what the issue is, uh, the compelling case that is made, mm-hmm. and obviously I only have so many hours in a day. Yeah. I can't support every single thing, and it, no offense to you, but if <laughs> what you're pushing right. you know, will benefit – I'm making this up, five people. Yeah. And, you know, what Steve's pushing mm-hmm. uh, will benefit 5,000 people. Right. I may have to make a cognitive decision based on time. Mm-hmm. But typically it's things that are having the greatest uh, negative impact on our community and things that I think I can adjust through either legislation, yeah. advocacy, uh, creating an advisory committee. So perfect example, behavioral health. Yeah. Uh, we're fortunate in Winnebago County to have the one cent uh, public safety or one cent mental health tax or half cent mental health tax. I'm sorry. Um, 
is generating a ton of money. I think that board's doing a good job getting mm-hmm. that money out. I would say uh, a couple of things. One, that board is naturally reactive yeah, um, because they're saying, hey, apply, and then they're reacting to what's being applied for. Right. There is no known community-wide, holistic uh, document that shows where are our strengths in mental health mm-hmm. and where are our gaps. Gotcha. And my thing is, uh, so recently I created a behavioral health advisory board. hmm made up of some of the largest uh, service providers. Mm -hmm. So if it's Rose Grants, if Mm -hmm. it's the three health systems, the community-based health uh, facilities that we have, if it's NAMI, who represents so many more grassroots types of organizations and individuals uh, who have mental illness, um, there is probably 15 different members to it. And what I have tasked them with is saying, please review the landscape. Mm -hmm. Speak to the community okay. and let me know with an action-oriented plan, not a study. I don't want something I'm going to put on a shelf. Right. I need an action-oriented plan of where are those gaps for services. Yeah. So I liken this very similar to what we did with domestic violence. So when I came into office, I didn't say we're going to build a family peace center. Okay. What we did is we listened to more than 100 survivors. Mm-hmm. We interviewed more than 150 stakeholders. And we created what we called a gap document. Mm -hmm. And we listed out all of the gaps that we see in the systems uh, that are in place. Some were really difficult to handle, right? I mean, uh, for me to tell the police chief, hey, (laughs) uh, the gap is you all need to respond in a (laughs) little more trauma-informed way and you're not doing things right. Absolutely. Difficult conversations. But we put them in writing and we published it. It's on our City of Rockford website and we are literally strategically – and methodically going through every one of those gaps Mm -hmm. to help create programs that fill those gaps. And so they're informed by the organizations doing the work, and most importantly, they're informed by people with lived experiences that can tell us, are these really gaps, or are there gaps that maybe the people who are doing the work don't quite see? (laughs) Right, right. So so then what about the, and I hate to call them this, common person, right? Like, um, the common person that wants to have a conversation with the mayor about something that's happening in their community. Like, how does that how does that come to fruition? How do they have that conversation with you other than trying to get to your office, making appointments? How do they sit down with you? Like you and I, because, I mean, we, for some reason we met, it's in, it's in the universe that we met, right? Mm-hmm. And we met a couple of times, but... Someone that don't have that tenacity to go out and say, okay, I need to meet with the mayor. I need to have a conversation with the mayor. How do you reach that person? So I would say a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One is two different tracks. Um, One, if they want to meet on a one-on-one level, they do have to have some tenacity. I can't read their mind. Um, (laughs) So I would say I try to be as accessible and open. Mm -hmm. So you know, depending on the issue, depending on all that, my time and my availability, the Mm -hmm. schedule – I'm going to set up an in-person, a virtual, or a phone call with pretty much any single person who wants to contact me. They can reach me on my cell. It's 815-262-6734. They can reach me on my email, thomas.mcnamara at Mm rockfordil.gov. They can call my assistant, Haley Galarza, or email her. Hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, Mm -hmm. Instagram. Any way you want, you can reach me. Um, And it's me who responds. Um, Unless you call my assistant, then she will. Uh, (laughs) So there's that aspect. I would say the other thing is one of the neatest honors I have and greatest responsibilities is I got to go where people are. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I could look at my schedule and be like, well, I don't really need to go there. They're not Mm going to vote for me. Maybe they're I'm a Democrat for anyone listening. Maybe they're a, you know, a Trump Republican. I'm like, they're not going to vote for me. Right. I need to go there. Yeah. They're citizens of Rockford. If they vote for me or not, I don't care. Right. Um, and so I would say, come and talk to me. I want to he- talk to you. I, obviously, I am busy and sometimes busier than I, I think is feasible <laughs> right. to do. Absolutely. But I want to make that time. So mm-hmm. I am purposeful in where I go so that I can reach as many people and specifically those that often don't have the voice that I think they yeah. uh, should have or they feel that they deserve to have. Well, I, I'm, I'm definitely a witness to that. You go everywhere. I, I mean, try. I, 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 you can see, uh, I'll see you at a church function. I'll see you at a picnic uh, with your daughters asking for chips. <laughs> I mean, everywhere. You're everywhere. Don't give my daughter Cheetos. Give her Lay's. <laughs> That's what you told me, right? <laughs> don't give her that. But, no, like, I love the fact that you're engaging yourself with the community like you do was that like a 
personal uh, goal of yours or business? What was that? Why did you come in with that kind of perspective? Like, I needed to be involved in, in the community like that. Because most of them don't, to be honest with you. Most mayors don't engage like you get, engage. I don't know that. Um, it's a job, man. We sign up for it. It's an honor. I mean, I literally ran. Uh, my wife will remind me occasionally uh, <laughs> that I knocked on doors to mm-hmm. get this job. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's it's just a really big honor. And I think if you don't take it seriously, move out of the way. Let someone else who's going to take it seriously do yeah. it. Yeah. Um it's not always easy. That work-life balance is certainly not one that I am an expert in uh, and one I should probably work on a lot harder than I do. Um, but, it, I mean, just breaking it down, you got 148,000 people um, and you live in Rockford, Illinois, you got to be honest and face the facts and you look at the poverty levels, you look yeah. at the educational achievement yeah. levels, yeah. like people need a voice and they need help. And if I'm not going to go there... A, I shouldn't be in the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I'm not going to go there, who will? And so my thought is be as many places I, uh, as I can. I'm not doing this for a lifetime career. Yeah. Um, this is really – I love Rockford. I want to be a better place, and I want to get it to a spot that I can hand the baton off to whoever she is, uh, mm-hmm. and hopefully they oh, do a better job. She, you already – We need a one. woman mayor. I we okay. absolutely need a woman mayor. Gotcha, gotcha. So We've speak- never had a woman mayor. We haven't? No, well, never. Wow, it's first time for everything, right? So we need one. So uh, let's let's switch gears to school. Let's talk about the school system. Okay. What's your uh, perspective on uh, our young people? My thing is this, is that I feel, because I am a therapist, because I believe in mental health, I think there is a uh, significant parallel between education and the lives outside of the uh, educational system. So you have your home life that's intersecting with the school therefore the learning is not uh where it should should be but i think a lot of the 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 things that go around town is that the teachers may not be doing their jobs or or the superintendent may not be doing this and that but there is a combination of everything coming together to make pretty much a perfect opportunity for our kids to thrive we're not we're not having that or we're not seeing that right what's your opinion what's your thoughts when it comes to the school system so I think what you said has a lot of validity to it and would agree, I think, with nearly all of it, if not all of it. Um, I would say two different facets. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is I'm a big believer that trauma that our young people have been impacted by play probably the largest role uh, or one of the largest roles in our low educational achievement scores. Mm-hmm. I mean, when uh, 46% of our black kids, 29% of our Hispanic and 28, or 29% of our Hispanic and 28% of our white kids aren't graduating, mm-hmm. something's yeah. not going right. I and I would say it's not just one thing, but trauma is a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And I think with the programs and policies put in place in the schools can help with it. Mm-hmm. It'll never stop it from yeah. happening right. because of, that's happening most often in the homes, mm-hmm. um, as you stated. But we could be doing more from that aspect. I would say overall, uh, I make a big uh, emphasis on getting out to schools. I average going to about 25 of them a a year Mm -hmm. uh, while they're in session. And I think our teachers do a phenomenal job. I think we have some amazing young kids who are down the peak of just they're going to do awesome (laughs) stuff. I'm very happy and secure knowing that the generation coming up uh, will do great things for Rockford. I would say there are things that I think the school district could do. They now have, uh, by and large, a brand new board, Mm -hmm. uh, much more community centric. I see them already out more in the community Mm -hmm. at community events I'm at. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went almost six years with seeing about one board member at a neighborhood meeting. I think those board members need to be out to the community so that they can actually hear what's going on. Absolutely. Hearing a public comment, that's just three minutes of someone typically right. upset about Absolutely. one issue Absolutely. and about one child, theirs, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, so get out to the neighborhood, see what's going on. I would say the second is those schools, the physical assets that we have, there's what, 44, 48 schools in mm-hmm. Rockford. Mm-hmm. Um, these are physical assets that are paid for by taxpayers. Mm-hmm. Let's light them up. Gotcha. Let's get them uh, 
up and open uh, after the school hours during the week. Wow. Let's open them up during the weekend. Mm -hmm. Let's get community organizations. Let's get you in there having a special session mm -hmm. from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. <laughs> right, right, Anyone right. who's dealing with mental health concerns, let's get you in there. Yeah. Um, if it's 100 strong, let's get them over at Auburn. Right. I mean, you think about the number of mentors that could be coming literally a block and a half down the street. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think we got to open up those doors in a safe, in a controlled, organized way. Um, but those those schools should be lighthouses for every single neighbor uh, in their neighborhood. I like that because uh, I really believe that we should be allowed to go into the schools. I know you definitely have to do your background checks and things of that nature because you want to keep the kids safe and the staff and the teachers. You want to keep them safe. But I think that uh, we need to open up doors for more of us to go into these schools and be a part of these kids' lives. I, so for me, growing up with my grandfather, he never came to the school. Never. I mean, but I I know that if he would have, it would have been a great sight to have him there to see the one to support. And then I wouldn't have did half the stuff I did in school. But, you know, to for them, for us to be able to ingratiate ourselves into the school system. I love it. Now, the thing is, though, is. It's difficult to get into the schools, Mayor. It's difficult for us to get in to mentor these kids and be a part of that. Mm -hmm. What can we do to kind of, you know, minimize that 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 red tape process? Yeah. So for listeners, uh, I don't control the schools. Mm -hmm. I was very active in uh, the school board races recently because I wanted to influence just that. Yeah. Um, and I think we are. <laughs> uh, all those that ran out that we supported one okay um i think it starts at the top i think dr jared uh has now a good board to work with uh mm -hmm. to get those more open i think it's going to take time i mean okay. those new board members are probably still figuring out where the bathrooms are and right, everything else, right right i get that um but i think that is the key um typically i have found the best amount of success when you go principal to principal okay uh Truthfully, the school administration has provided principals with a lot of authority and autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to do something system wide, you do got to go through the board. And I think getting people on that board, I mean, we just got a licensed social worker I know. on the board. Yeah, I know. Uh, we just got someone who's been working in reentry work mm -hmm. uh, for the probably the Which last 10 years on that board. So it's not the typical type of people that we've had on that board. And I, not that. You know, a business background isn't a great thing. It is. Mm -hmm. We just don't need seven of them. Right, right. Uh, we need a, something that's reflective of our community, that's reflective go. of different professions that can have benefits uh, for our young people. And I would say you're right. You have to do the backgrounds. But you also inside that have to be uh, – you have to be willing to adapt and be open mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people who may have made some really stupid, horrible choices mm -hmm. who now today yeah. have turned their lives around absolutely, and want to help turn the lives of young people around. Absolutely. And honestly, I know you look at me and you're like, man, this dude's so cool. <laughs> um, but I'm not. <laughs> right, and I, I'm right. not going to be able to connect right, with kids the right. way that someone who yeah. – you know, went through the system, talked to not every kid, uh, but talked to some kids who went through the system, turned, worked really hard, got mm -hmm. their family back together, turned their life around, now may own a business or yeah. has a great job. Like that person can change someone's life. Let's totally put them to work. Totally. I totally agree with you on that. So <coughs> we, we need to uh, probably start something and say, if you got a history or a background, let's check it out. Let's see yeah. what it is and then see where you can help at. Because I do, I, I agree with you. Most people that has made that transition that have changed, I'm one of them, want to make a profound effect in, in the community. We yeah. want to impact the community to the point where we can see young people changing their minds. I really think that it needs to happen early on rather than later. Because most kids are already sure. developing in that stage of mindset, and so they're going to already be looking to do things mischievous. But if you can get them early on, second, third grade, because it, to be honest with you, most of these uh, uh, second and third graders have experienced some things that most 20 and 25-year-olds haven't. For so sure. to get them at that age to undo some of those things, and that's the tra traumatic piece of it, you know. Yeah. being able to go in and speak to that trauma. So I worked at a community-based correctional facility. We called them halfway houses in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And it was a 140-bed facility. And I was a – first I started as a case manager, and I ended up running 
120 beds of the 140, the county wow. work release program. And the best case manager there, her name was Stephanie Holloway. Mm -hmm. She spent 10 years, uh, around 10 years uh, in the institution, and she came out and changed her life. And she had an ability to talk to people and had experiences that I did not have. Right. And we need and to value those experiences and help kids with them. Yeah. No, I, I, I think a little bit of your personality comes out in your job. I think that when we see you around, I think that's just authentically who you are as a person. Would you agree? I, I try. <laughs> I mean, my wife would say no. She would say... <laughs> She would say at home, he's in sweatpants or the same shorts I've owned for 15 years mm -hmm. and a white T-shirt. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm wearing this uniform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think most of our wives will say that, you know, because we're <laughs> super busy. But you know what, though? Your engagement into the community, I want to continue to talk a little bit more about your engagement with mental health. Like, I understand you said, you know, trauma's at the base of everything. But why did you choose to aggressively attack mental health the way you have? So this was new for me. Mm -hmm. um, I had an opportunity. I was campaigning. And so I created a list of about 150, 200 people that I needed to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, truthfully, I wanted their support. Mm -hmm. um, and I would listen. And I just I didn't ask for their support. I just said what things are going well, what things aren't going well, how if I got elected, should I help improve them? Right. And I had uh, a meeting with Jennifer Cachapalia at Octane. And she was, as she is, very upfront with me mm -hmm. uh, and very passionate. And she said, don't even think I'm going to uh, help you, support you, anything, unless domestic violence is part of your platform. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what do I, how can I help that? And that's in someone's <laughs> home. Jennifer, I'm, yeah. how do I help that? And I was dumb and naive. And she, in the best way possible, educated me. Mm -hmm. um, let me listen to people who have experienced it. Let me understand ways that the system that people like me have set up have failed people time and time again. And then, so I was like, all right, I not only want her support, but if I get it elected, I'm hiring her. Right. Um, <laughs> and then as we, we did that, I mm -hmm. was able to hire her. And as we did that, we just continued to dive into the data. Mm -hmm. And then when we dove into the data and we coupled the data with actually talking to people who were living it, mm -hmm. Everything turned to trauma. Wow. Everything. And honestly, I, I feel bad saying this to you with your expertise, <laughs> um, but I was like, trauma is like a frou-frou word, like unless it's like really big trauma that's yeah. very personal and big. Yeah. Like it, you know, if I didn't personally experience it, if it was, you know, let's say a shooting mm -hmm. three doors down, how am I traumatized about it? You know, absolutely. like, but you are. Right? You, you absolutely <laughs> I get it are. now, all right? Right. <laughs> so right. hold up on me, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> but just talking to people with the lived experience, coupling it with the data, honestly, I'd be, a, I'm not special. I'd be a fool if I didn't yeah. follow the mental health aspect of yeah. it because I think mental health impacts uh, violent crime. I think it impacts our educational achievement levels. I think it impacts economic development. I think it impacts people's civic pride. I think it impacts every aspect of our city. Mm -hmm. And so I'm elected to impact our city. Yes, so I got to go to those you things are. that are having the biggest impact. Yeah. And it really is. So I want to get a little personal with you right now. Oh, and <laughs> I and see, you know, I'm known for put, putting people on the spot, but um, I want to get a little bit personal. But I'm I closer also... to the door, though. So I'm, I'm known to <laughs> no, no. do an Irish goodbye. Yeah, no, we're not going to do that. But no, because I really want people to see you for your humanity, because I, I've been around you a little bit now. And I know, I think I can, I'm a good judge of character and especially when it comes to your heart when this thing happened with George Floyd a couple of years ago how did you personally handle that and how did you think you did uh, as a city official handling that because that was tough I know it had to be tough for you it was definitely tough for me and you talk about the vicarious trauma that you know just seeing that and especially as a black man how did you handle that situation Man, um, in some ways, I think I did as well as I could. Okay. And in some ways, I think I probably failed miserably. Wow. Um, I was really fortunate. Uh, I was really fortunate. Uh, I 
called on a lot of people. I mean, mm. as you can tell, I'm not black. Um, <laughs> no, you're not. You're, you're not light skinned. <laughs> I'm about as white as they come. <laughs> He's not light skinned, guys. <laughs> um, so I called on a friends. Uh, I called on black friends, and I then called on their friends. Mm. And I, to this day, every two weeks, still have a standing meeting that at that point was about every two days. Yeah. About what do I need to know? What can you educate me on? Right. How can I learn? Right. What are your thoughts of what we should be doing as a community? And so one of my biggest things was dive into people who had experiences that I didn't have yeah. and listen to them. Uh, I would say it was really difficult. It still, to this day, remains difficult because um, I'm in a unique position, and it's really difficult. I mean... It just it becomes really difficult and can be conflicting in your own self yeah. uh, with what you want to do and what you may know is best for the city. Right. Always speaking my mind and exactly the way I think things should be mm-hmm. is not always the best thing for the city. <laughs> no. I mean, I get it. because words do matter. It does. And if I come out really strong, yeah. it can change the entire din- dynamic right. of the city. I'm not saying I'm special. I know um, you're the mayor, but I get it. I mean, we've seen that at the presidential, right? Yeah, right. Good and bad. Right. Um, and I'm not saying I'm that either. But uh, you take, uh, I mean, the worst, some of the worst things that I have to deal with is if we have a city employee, say a police officer, do something really stupid. Yeah. I may know how stupid it is. I may know how egregious and horrible it is. I also understand that anything I use, uh, say or do mm-hmm. will be used in that court case. That's true. And I... Also know in that court case, once the criminal case is done, I know that there will be a civil case. Mm -hmm. And I also know that the city will be sued. Mm -hmm. And I know that my statements will be in that. And so one of the things I struggled the most with in, I got a lot of grief over it, um, was if, and I still do, Mm -hmm. and I, I get it and I can appreciate it, but I may have feelings that I can't always share. Yeah. In a public fashion. Right. And not, you will have citizens who want me and some feel I need to, mm-hmm. and I get and respect all of it. Right. But if my legal counsel and others are saying, no, 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 right. you cannot say anything more, mm-hmm. um, I have this conflict. And I can say at times I've went over what legal opinion have said, <laughs> and sometimes I have failed miserably for the citizens and not. Yeah. And that is something that has been really difficult um, to do. But I, I will say there's lots of things I'm proud that we got done during that time period. I am a believer that you don't let a crisis go to waste. Um, Rockford Promise, it got done. 65% of the scholars mm-hmm. are minority students. 70% are first-generation college-going students. We held seven. We had citizen-led committee mm-hmm. hold 17 public meetings mm-hmm. about the city of Rockford Police Department's use of force policy. Gotcha. They presented a host of changes. All of them were accepted by a Rockford Police Department. Uh, We had citizens say they wanted a civilian oversight board. We held 25 meetings with uh, more than 15 organizations representing at those meetings. Mm -hmm. They all wanted one. They all wanted it differently. And we had talked about getting a civilian oversight board in the city of Rockford for more than a decade, actually after the Barmore uh, death. Uh, And we got that done. So we get money from cannabis, right? Mm -hmm. Well, during that time period, we allocated all revenue, not a portion, all revenue that we get from cannabis Mm -hmm. to go to distressed communities and to individuals uh, who have been failed by the war on drugs. Uh, So, and there's a whole host of other things from body cameras, you name it. We did it during that time period. So I think policy-wise and stuff, we got a lot done. I would say... um, you know, one thing I regret, I uh, that also was a difficult, and, and this is, well, I'm not even, that sounds like an excuse. It was a difficult time for me for other reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, so the uh, protest on May 30th, yeah. I was scheduled to go. I was mm-hmm. also pulled away for a personal thing that I couldn't get out of. Mm-hmm. I so wish I was there. <laughs> I mean, I don't wish I was at the end of it, right. um, but I wish I was in that park. Uh, because I think it it would have said something important. You say it's great that I'm everywhere. Well, I wasn't there, so I'm not everywhere. Right. And 
I am upset with myself that I couldn't be in both places. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't, that's not one of those events that you're like, Hey, will you go and sub for me? Right. right. It was, I'm there or I'm not. Yeah. And I couldn't be, I had brothers and sisters, my, my brothers and sisters who were actually there, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that don't matter. No, I don't. (laughs) Um, you're the mayor and they're not. Right. Right. (laughs) Uh, so I mean, there's areas I failed miserably and there's areas I think we did well. So percentage wise, I think you've done pretty good uh, percentage wise since you've been in office. And um, so what's next for the city of Rockford from the mayor's office? What's what can we anticipate happening in the next few years? Oh, man. So a lot. We're not going to sit back. So a ton of stuff. One, we've opened phase one of the Family Peace Center. We need phase two. Gotcha. Phase two should be about 60 to 70, 60 to 75,000 square feet, should have a medical clinic in it, okay. should have job opportunities for survivors and their children. Uh, two, we should be expanding uh, Rock for Promise. Three, we should have Metra actually pulling up here and wait. picking up residents. I can't wait. Uh, four, uh, we should have the Barbara Coleman deal done. It comes up very soon, mm-hmm. uh, or it just came up, depending on when this comes out. Yeah. Um, we need that development done. I mean, that's gotcha. a game changer, transformational project in Southwest Rockford. Gotcha. Uh, I think you are going to see continued uh, emphasis on mental health, but I would say from even more of a holistic level, like we've done handle with care. Are you yeah. Through, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, we've done some, some programs around it, but we really have to find out what does that continuum look like and what do uh, – people with lived experience and what is the data showing us and we need to be uh, much more aligned in filling those gaps. Gotcha. Uh, I think from infrastructure standpoint, we just approved the largest capital improvement plan in our city's history. Uh, our typical plan was about 180 to $200 million. We mm-hmm. just approved a $350 million plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at that, uh, a good chunk of that money, if not the vast majority of it, Mm -hmm. is going to Southeast and West Rockford, where it's really needed. Uh, 11th Street, Auburn Street, Mm -hmm. Whitman Street, Mm -hmm. School Street. Uh, You you look at those, uh, they're in deplorable condition. It's not acceptable. We need investments. And where the city invests does a couple of things. It draws other investment and also tells the residents that we give a damn about them. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I'm going to ask it to you the way I would would hear it is – why are we continuing to build on the east side when the west side is is looks like it's depleted? Like, so I had a question asked uh, a couple weeks ago: is why do we continue to put stores and and businesses in parking lots of grocery stores and things of that nature, and then we don't have anything on the west side? What can we tell people about what we're doing for that? So a couple of things: one on like stores and stuff, Mm -hmm. we don't control that. Gotcha. I mean, no one's calling me, like if you just saw the Dick's Sporting Goods store is now going to be something else, like Mm -hmm. Sierra or Mm -hmm. whatever it is. I didn't know that. (laughs) When you found out, I found out. Right. I mean, that's a private market deal. There you go. Um, I will say what we control Mm -hmm. are a couple of things. One, the physical capital and infrastructure investments. Okay. Truthfully, you can look at the plans. No one will believe it, but the vast majority of the money recently is going to the west side. I mean, South Main Street, that's on the west side. Yeah. North Main Street, that's on the west side. Yeah. West State Street, that's on the west side. Mm-hmm. Uh, 11th Street's not on the west side, but it's in a very depressed area. That's going to be a $40 million project. Uh, you look at Auburn Street, that's probably going to be a close to a $50 million project. All these are in our plan and our program mm-hmm. to get done. Okay. So our physical investments that we control 100%, yeah. you can't argue, no one can argue based on facts mm-hmm. that in the last six years mm-hmm. that we're putting more money on the east side. So um, how do we encourage the, the builders and the, and the project developers to put it over on closer to the west end, putting things over there? Because yep. I know if you're looking at Washington Park, I actually grew up in those when, yeah. it, when it was Concord. Yeah. Uh, across there, it's just this large piece of land there and looked like they started digging at one point and then it just stopped and it's just there. So what it, what it, what about the West End? I mean, yep. So great question. The second piece of what I was going to say is what we control are incentives. Gotcha. And so one of those incentives is it's public important. infrastructure. No one's going to a street that there's all no. broken up. Right, so right. redoing West State is critical, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's called Springfield Corners that you're talking about, that Springfield yep. and West State Street. Yep. So when I became mayor, that was not owned by us, mm-hmm. and nothing was happening with it. Gotcha. So I bought it. Uh, and now we own it, and now we're marketing it. 
and we will offer incentives for it. Uh, I will tell you what incentives we can provide based on where it's at, mm -hmm. all changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's close to the river and it's in a, I mean, everyone says, well, look at all the buildings. The mayor only cares about downtown and all that BS. <laughs> right. it, well, there's a tax credit that people get mm -hmm. for redeveloping historic buildings along yeah. our river. Yeah. That's not something I did. Actually, that's the state legislature. Right. Um, but we have tax increment financing that we can provide. We have enterprise zone funding that we can provide that gives a sales tax rebate on construction materials. Uh, we have a redevelopment fund that we can put money towards. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are. I, th I mean, if you look at what's taking place recently, yeah. um, I mean, let's go through it. The Bonton, fa former vacant fa Bonton facility up at Sports Corps 1, right. it's hopping. You got 800 jobs from Amazon in it. Ingersoll Manufacturing, further down on North Main and Fulton area, yeah. uh, just expanded by 40,000 square feet, hired more people, and they just built the world's largest telescope on the west side. Uh, you look at uh, Crusader Clinic on the west side. They just built a $20 million yep. brand-new clinic and administration offices. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at... Um, if you're coming, let's say, downtown, mm -hmm. uh, the west side of downtown is where all the development has taken place. The Talcott building was redeveloped. The Burnham Lofts building was redeveloped. Mm -hmm. The library is going in on the west side, brand new $40 million yes. library. Yes. You look at 301 South Main Street, west yeah. side, brand new mm -hmm. construction. You look at Cedar Street, the two buildings right along Cedar Street, yeah. that's 18 to $24 million. You look at the 700 block of South Main Street, that's a mega fab facility turning into apartments and lofts there. You look at Barbara Coleman. It's a largest, Barbara Coleman would be the largest development in our city's history, yeah. and it ain't happening way out by I-90. It's right. happening on the banks it's, of the west side yeah. of the river. Right. Um, so I would argue we are investing on the west side. Mm -hmm. um, now, west is different to everyone, right? Yeah, it, uh, there you go. Amen. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've learned that. There, um, there you go. In six years as mayor, yeah. uh, four as alderman, I've learned what, what the west side is depends you on go. who you're talking who to. Who you're talking to. So an area that we need to strengthen, mm -hmm. uh, I look at really from Auburn to West State Street. Mm -hmm. Lots of people consider really from Kilburn All, yeah, up, yeah. you know, to them, that's west side. And everything else, <laughs> that's the east side. I don't know how they determine that. <laughs> it used to be based on the river, but uh, some don't care. No. Um, so we're putting a community healing center. And the Boys and Girls Club. That's uh, awesome. It's a one-stop shop of community healing for any person impacted by trauma because of violence. Yeah. Uh, we're doing that. Right now, there's an Avon development for affordable housing right on Avon Street. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that Aldi's just built or is in the process of building a new, side. not in that mm -hmm. spot, but working towards it. I think when you see School Street redone, mm -hmm. uh, when you see Auburn Street redone, that's when we'll really start seeing more and more development. And I will also say the vast majority of our investments in neighborhoods yeah. needs to take place in those areas as well. Well, the thing about it, Mayor, I can sit here and talk to you hours about what you're doing, but I see what you're doing. I know a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of some of those things. Yeah. But I will say this is... Um, and I know you told me don't talk to you about this, but what's next? What's next for the mayor? I mean, you're not in office too much longer. What's next? Yeah, don't talk to me about it. <laughs> um, I'll be doing an Irish goodbye, just <laughs> leaving. Um, you know, I mean it like I really I got the best job. Okay. I really do. I mean, I grew up here. I at least get to attempt to make a positive impact every day in people's lives and the city. Um, I don't have big aspirations. I would say my biggest aspirations are, um, I want to make sure my wife still loves me. Um, <laughs> and I want my kids to, I want to be able to go to things for my kids. Gotcha. Uh, so will I run another term? Maybe. Um, if I did, that'd be it. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that now. Yeah. Um, I thought two would be for sure. And there's some projects maybe I'll run for another um, that I want to see done. Um, but the big thing, I just want to be there for my kids and make sure uh, they're happy, they're healthy, and that they like each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they like me. Uh, I was really, really fortunate growing up. I mean, I, my dad joked, I don't know what this uh, podcast is rated, but my dad joked, uh, 
he would always tell me I was a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. <laughs> um, and it wasn't, we weren't wealthy. Right. We weren't poor, though. Gotcha. I mean, we gotcha. were very, probably middle to upper middle class. Okay. Didn't have nice Nike shoes or mm-hmm. anything, but I had nice shoes. <laughs> um, I don't know how to explain it. Like, yeah. I wore Patrick Ewing shoes, not Michael Jordan's, okay? <laughs> um, uh, but I had two parents that loved me, mm-hmm. two parents that I thought were there anytime I needed them. Yeah. And I had five brothers and sisters that, to this day, uh, they are my friends. Good. Like, I don't have this huge circle of friends right. and buddies I'm going to go hang out with. Like, right. me and my brothers will go on a vacation together and it'll just be us gotcha. this uh coming up uh what's in what's new for me coming up uh for 40 years ever since i've been alive my entire family takes one week off and we go on vacation mm-hmm. no tv That's re- awesome. really horrible internet and this year there'll be 36 of us mm-hmm. um in one space for a week so There'll be some fights. Uh, <laughs> my wife will tell you it's, it's certainly not a vacation. It's a trip. Mm-hmm. Um, when my dad was with us, he would tell you it was a mandatory performance. Uh, but it <laughs> was. Mandatory performance. But I loved it. Yeah. I mean, my kids love it. They all get to see the other cousins mm-hmm. and stuff. So that's being around family, however that is. And work-wise, since that's probably what you wanted. Um <laughs> Something making a difference that I'm not doing the same thing every day. Okay. I couldn't sit and behind a desk every day and just do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a beautiful part of my job is mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a list person, yeah. um, but I rarely make it through my list right. because there's something that's popping up. It's something that's going on. You mm-hmm. get to help solve problems, and you're always moving around, and you get to meet all different people. That's good. Um, usually when, I, uh, when we get ready to end the show, I always give – um, I guess, an opportunity to just kind of leave some advice and to just leave some type of in, in words of encouragement. Okay. Um, what would you like to say to the people of Rockford? What would you like to leave with them? Um, and something that they need to know about where your heart is when it comes to the city of Rockford. Yeah, so I'll give one item for the city and one for just people. Um, for the city, I would say get engaged. Uh, we need you. If you are engaged, stay engaged. We need you engaged, and we need you to drag others to be engaged because uh, we have a deficit in pride Mm -hmm. uh, of where we live, and we need to increase that dramatically. And we can do that Mm -hmm. uh, by telling people what's being done but also allowing them to be part of what is done. Um, For just people, uh, and I struggle with this every day, so don't think I'm an expert at it, uh, but I really believe – everything's about attitude and gratitude. You get to control the attitude that you're going to take that day on with, Mm -hmm. and you get to control and be aware of what you can be grateful for. And I think, you know, um, life is not always fun. It is often very difficult. Uh, But no matter how difficult it is, Mm -hmm. like, there's a lot to be grateful for, right? So, like, I could have the world's worst day. Today has truthfully been a long day. (laughs) Um, But I know when I click the double click on my car to lock it and it honks my horn to say that my car's locked mm-hmm. and I'm at home, mm-hmm. I know for a fact Malachi and Olympia will be running out that door. They okay. don't give a blank if care. I am mayor right. or not. <laughs> they probably will be like, are we getting Pokemon cards? Are we right? getting ice cream? What's for dessert? <laughs> but they'll be smiling yeah. and they'll be loving me. Yeah. I got a lot to be grateful for on the worst day. So does everyone. That's good. That's good. Uh, I May I really appreciate this. You didn't have to. Uh, appreciate you. I asked you and you was like, I'm on it. I'll be there. I really do appreciate this opportunity. And people don't. I wanted to do this because I wanted people to see another side of you. I wanted people to see that how accessible you are, but also to be able to respect you. And you've done a great job with this city. I'll be the first to say I've been here through three, three mayors, probably. I think three. But. Regardless of that, you have been 100% authentic. I appreciate that. And uh, just keep doing a great job. Um, appreciate I'd like to thank everybody that was listening here today and, and uh, checking us out. Um, as I always say at the end of my uh, session with someone, we all have the ability to change our circumstances only if we focus on what we can change. So thank you, Mayor, for once sure. again for coming. Uh, we're out. See you guys later. Yeah, thank you.